Uh, welcome, 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 everyone. Um, I would like to talk to you uh, tonight um, about the language of the stars, right? And how basically, how can we apply some uh, things and some methods that we learned from analyzing languages, how can we apply those to stars and particularly to the luminosity of stars in order to find exoplanets, to find whether there are planets orbiting um, other stars. Um, and um, I don't know how much um, astronomy uh, you know, but uh, it all started basically with Johannes Kepler, who was a German astronomer uh, and who uh, is uh, basically quite uh, famous for uh, developing the laws of uh, planetary uh, motion. And based on his name and his achievements, uh, NASA had um, a mission called Kepler uh, that launched in uh, March of 2009 with this very specific purpose of trying to find um, exoplanets orbiting uh, other stars. Uh, the mission uh, lasted for uh, about nine years, actually a little bit over uh, nine, nine years. Um, and um, there were more than 500,000 stars that were observed uh, during uh, the Kepler mission. And uh, uh, during uh, all this time, um, uh, the scientists found uh, actually 2,662 exoplanets, right? So quite a large number of exoplanets that uh, we know uh, that now um, exist in the universe um, outside our solar system. And these are, were only the planets found by Kepler because after Kepler, there is another mission that is now ongoing called TESS and other exoplanets have been found like that, and also through other methods. Um, and some of the first exoplanets, um, um, they have been found all the way back in the 90s, right? So the very first exoplanet was uh, found by these astronomers, uh, Walchen and Frail, um, that looked at this pulsar PSR B1257 plus 12, that was all the way uh, 2000, 300 light years away. And how did they find that there are exoplanets around this, uh, this, um, uh, this pulsar? Uh, basically, those all, they saw that now and then there were pulses that came from there that were a little off in the data, right? So those off the beats pulsar were regular intervals. And this is how they basically detected that there were um, two planets, one that was three times and the other one that was four times bigger than the mass of Earth. Then there was another exoplanet that was uh, basically found by a graduate student in 1995, um, who uh, found uh, through this method radial velocity or wobbling of the stars, um, that found uh, an exoplanet around 51 Pegasi. And basically, how do we find these exoplanets? How do scientists find exoplanets? So it all starts with the data. So we are looking at the data. We don't actually see right, these planets the same way that when we are looking through the telescope to see the planet Mars or uh, the planet Venus or the planet Jupiter. So um, basically, um, as I was telling you before, the first way in which these um, exoplanets were found was through this method called radial velocity or wobbling. What does it mean that when a planet is circling around the star, then the planet itself, then the star itself exhibits this kind of wobbling. Um, the scientists call this a Doppler shift, but looking at this wobbling, that's how in the data, that's how the scientists uh, find that uh, there is a star that is altering the movement, uh, that there is a planet that is altering the movement of the star. So this is one way. Then there is a, a direct imaging, uh, or in a way um, through which I was telling you that we don't actually really see the stars. Actually, this is one way in which we kind of, kind of see exactly these stars. 
but there are very, very few uh, exoplanets that have been detected like this because the luminosity of the planet is quite uh, smaller comparatively to the luminosity of the star. And the, through this method, we can detect only large, hot and young planets. So we, there are definitely, there can be other types of planets that are more like Earth that cannot be detected through this method. But the most successful method through which we are detecting exoplanets is the transit method. What does the transit method mean? That whenever we have a planet that is circling around the star, and whenever that planet is passing if we're in front of that star, we can see a dip in the brightness or the luminosity of the star. And this is how, again, by looking into the data and looking at the dips into the, this luminosity here, we can basically detect and say that there is an exoplanet over there. So, this is a very brief, in a nutshell, brief history of exoplanets and how exoplanets are being detected. Um, I was wondering if uh, anyone has uh, any comments or uh, if uh, they have any questions so far. So there was a question whether this will work even for tiny planets or asteroids. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very good question. Um, it's not working for the most, for the tiniest planetoids that, that um, are orbiting around the star. So it also depends on how bright the star is and how far away it is, right? So it, uh, it depends, but we usually, or the scientists usually find planets that are at least the size of Earth or bigger. Now, going back to the topic, right? Why are we talking about a language of the stars? Um, I wanted to mention that this whole idea of using languages and stars came from during uh, this uh, uh, artificial intelligence research accelerator called NASA Frontier Development Lab, where scientists, uh, data scientists and astrophysicists or planetary scientists, they come together to solve some of these the biggest questions that we have now in space sciences. And again, we looked at the uh, data that came from Kepler, and I'm showing you here on the left um, uh, bottom side how, you know, how a time series in general, how it looks like, right? How this data looks like. So it looks like very jittery, right? Like, like this. And this is what we end up analyzing. And we are looking at this data from uh, the methods of languages are the same methods with which we analyze languages because guess what? Human speech or human languages, they exhibit the very same patterns, right? So we can see here that we have very similar patterns. So we can use very similar methods to analyze that. So some of the questions that we are asking here is, can we use this natural language processing? And I'll tell you in a minute what this means, this NL whole NLP thing means. Can we use this in order to discover features in a time series? Because a time series, as you are seeing here, right, it uh, represents the um, all the data points that we um, uh, that we gathered through the uh, instrument through the um, through Kepler. So we we have all these data points that we collected in time, right? So here we have the time, and here we have the magnitude uh, or the brightness of the stars, right? So any light curve is essentially a time series. So can we use these methods to discover some features in this time series, and how good is it? And why would we do that? We are basically wanting to create a dictionary of star features that we can use as a genetic code to catalog and identify any stars in order that we can, uh, we could potentially even simulate these stars or some stars that we have not yet observed, right? So think about this in this way. We have these methods that we developed using algorithms in order to analyze languages, right? And then we have the data that comes from the stars and we put those together in order to discover like this genetic code or this dictionary of the stars. Right? 
So going back to the idea of what is natural language processing, um, and I don't know if some of you were uh, in some of the past webinars that were about artificial intelligence, natural language processing um, is um, a bunch of methodologies, right, that have been developed for, um, within the field of artificial intelligence in order to analyze uh, human languages, right? So if we have a, um, a sentence here, London is the capital and most populous city. What can we do with this phrase? What can, can we do with the way humans talk, right? We can parse it so we can separate it into different words. We can classify it so we can have different nouns that we, we, we put together. And we can basically um, cut it and transform it and put it together uh, in order to create new languages or in order to create new phrases or in order to understand which words are more likely to be together with other words, right? And if we are able to do this with this um, uh, body of methods called natural language processing, can we do the same basically with the stars? So can we cut the data points that we have uh, from the star into uh, different parts and then see which of these parts are more likely to be together with which parts and how can we again create these dictionaries of the stars. So for us um, as scientists, the biggest challenge came from trying to transform numbers into words, right? Because they, when, when you look at the, at the luminosity of the star and the data that comes from Kepler, those are numbers, right? It's zero, one, one point something, two, and so on. And how do we transform those actually into words, right? How, can, how, how do we transform those into books? So we used a few methods and um, um, we used, in this case, we use six different methods, but the idea is, again, we cut the data between, you know, if, if the data point is between zero and 10 or 10 and 20 and so on, and we cut the data and we put it into different buckets. And for that, each of those buckets, we assign it, we create a word, right? So each of those buckets becomes a word. And then we put the buckets together. And this is how we create sentences in, um, uh, that represent, uh, that we reconstruct the stars with, right? So there were these uh, six methods that we used. Um, we call them bean-based or maybe peaks and troughs where we looked at consecutive, you know, the highest points in the data and then the lowest points in the data. And then based on that, we created new words um, or we were looking at how disorganized the information and the measurements are in the data. And that's how we took that and created new words. Um, or if we uh, score that and we rank the data points in the light curves, and then we create words based on those scores, right? And think of this as, um, uh, as a different way to classify first, second, third, and so on of the more most important data points. And we take that and create a new word. Um, and uh, we also looked at the way uh, the <clears throat> uh, movements, right, of the uh, data points were, uh, are, is it going up? Is it going down? Are they at the same level? And uh, based on that, again, we created the different words. So how does such a star book look like? So you can see here that it looks like um, um, an association of letters and numbers so that we can track where um, each of these buckets come from. And this is what our actual algorithm, our natural language processing algorithm, what is actually reading, right? So it's reading a sentence that it's not very intelligible for us as humans, but it's quite understandable from the computer point of view. Okay, so um, are there any questions, any comments so far? So there were some questions whether you find some very interesting numbers that cluster together, or mm -hmm. do you just more or less see the same, like different types of numbers? Yes, that's a very good question. Yes, that is true. There are some numbers that um, 
are uh, more frequent and that they uh, also cluster together or that they are more likely to be one next to each other. And some other numbers that are more rare, right? What we call in statistics outliers, right? So that, uh, and, and for instance, when we are transforming that into a word, that means that that particular word in the star book is going to be more rare. While the data points that cluster and that are more frequent, those are words that are more common. So think about this in a way that, um, you know, words like um, chair, table, day, hello, are more common in the English language is the same. Some of the data points in the star are more common, but then we have some other words that are not so common, such as um, xylophone, uh, zebra, that don't show up in our language too often. And it's the same in the case of the stars. Those are the data points that we call outliers, right? So for example, um, if, if um, let me ask you a question now, right? So let's, let's do a very quick exercise. So let's say that we have, um, in a star, we have uh, all these data points and we have data points that uh, the following data points. Um, one, two, three, two, one, two, right? How would we create words from this? So again, one, two, three, two, one, two, right? How would you create some words from this? Let's say if you are looking at um, um, at consecutive um, peaks or at consecutive buttons of uh, in in the data, right? So if I have one, two, three, two, one, two, which are my button points? Those would be the ones, right? And which would be my peak points? That would be three. And then the third two would be the peaks, right? And then we create word where we have, uh, let's say uh, we can call that bottom one, right? So we, so we have a word called bottom, right? And then we'll have the second word called peak. And then we have again, bottom It's the same one, right? So we have bottom pick one, bottom pick two, bottom pick one, bottom pick two, okay? So that would be kind of a sentence that we created here, right? Um, do, let's do another example. So let's say that we have um, another sequence of, um, um, of numbers, right? That come from, from the star uh, that are the following. Um, three, two, one, two, one, three. Okay, so I'm skipping the two there, right? So I'm going three, two, one, two, one, three. Which are my throws or my, my buttons this time? They are still the ones, right? It's just that they don't start with the ones. So I start with the peak, right? I start with the peak. Which are my peaks? I have a three, I have a two, and then I have a three again, right? So I can create a word, let's say, pick three, bottom one, pick two, bottom one, pick three, right? So it's, it's even musical, right? And, and we all know that music and maths, that, that, that they have so, so much together, right? So much in common. Um, so again, it is, so this is how from the word, from the numbers itself, we create words and then based on this, we, we create uh, sentences. Okay. And example, just you know, to show you how these actual diagrams look like, right? In, in different cor corpora. So since we have, um, um, since we had uh, six methods through which we created these books of stars, we basically have what we call free corpora. So we have free books, right? So this is book number one that you see on the left where um, on the bottom, uh, you, uh, there are the different words that, that we created. So you cannot see all of them here because there, there are quite, um, too, there are too many of them. 
But what you can see here is basically that indeed, just like the question that I had before, we have more, um, we have some, um, uh, some um, uh, data points that cluster more together that show up more and some others that don't show up so often, right? So we have words that are more rare and we have words that are more common, right? And this is, this is different for each of the six books that we created, right? So in each of these data points and each of the colors in here represents a star, right? And we have all six books over here. So what do we do with all these books? And basically what do we uh, do with um, uh, the analysis of all these texts that we created? So we found that in this way, we can better catalog and classify the stars that the method through which we created the words in book number five of the stars seems actually to be the most promising in order to create these DNAs of the stars. And also just to give you a little bit of an idea of about how the actual light curves or luminosity of the stars, they look, how they look like. Um, so based on book five that we created, we can see here that the stars look more alike. Well, um, in other cases, the stars or the luminosity of the stars is not that alike, right? So here we have five different stars that actually are very similar to each other, while here that is not the case. And here the same, we have five different stars that are very similar to each other, while here that's, that's not the case. So the idea again is using these, um, this way in which we transform numbers into words and then analyzing the words, we can better catalog the luminosity of, of, uh, of these stars. Um, any questions so far, any comments? Um, I think uh, it would be better to continue uh, mm -hmm. because I think you lost people a little bit there. So. Okay. <laughs> no, it's not. So, okay. So, um, uh, the, uh, the um, okay, if um, uh, that's one way in which we can look uh, for exoplanets and trying to catalog the stars. Uh, but uh, the main method, as I was saying, is about natural language processing. And what else can we do with languages and natural language processing? So we can look at communication, right? The languages, human languages are a form of communication, but communication is not just about, you know, English or the way we talk to each other. Um, and communication is a complex system, and some of you are familiar with complex systems, right, because you had some other lectures and webinars about that. So what does it mean? It means that there is adaptation, that communication is like a living system, right, that evolves with us, that um, evolves with um, uh, whoever is uh, communicating with. Um, and can we, the idea here is, can we model the evolution of communication. So if we are thinking about how communication has started and the way uh, we as humans communicate with each other and then computers communicate with each other, can we think of interesting ways in which let's say here, for instance, are two cells, right? That are communicating or signaling with each other. Then we have plants, right? That are communicating with each other. And <clears throat> some researchers have shown that some, uh, some plants have, are actually communicating through a mycelium network, right? And if you go into the forest, so all, all the trees are communicating with each other based on these mushrooms or mycelium network that is underground, right? That almost looks like, like our internet, right? So plants and forests, they have their own internet and their own way of communicating. There is another way in which plants actually communicate with each other and that's through uh, some chemical signaling. So for example, what uh, you smell when the grass is being cut, when the grass is being mowed, right? That, that, that nice smell of, of freshness, right? That, that's actually a communication signal that the grass is emitting that something is disturbing it, right? So, so that's, that's another way in which you can think about communication. So both when we are looking at cells talking to each other, plants talking to each other, um, it's more, and it's a lot about uh, chemical communication. So they communicate through, through chemicals and through electric signals. So it's less about, um, they don't really have words, right? They don't have, 
a vocabulary or a language the same way that we do, but that doesn't mean that they don't actually exchange information and that they don't adapt uh, based on that, uh, that information. Um, then, of course, we move up and we see even in insects, right, in the animal world, there is a lot of communication. And if you've seen ants and bees, uh, you know, these insects are very social. They are almost like humans. They create uh, mini cities, they create um, pathways through which they, they go and try to find food. And, and the way they are finding their way is through pheromones. And these pheromones are actually another form of uh, chemical communication. And that's how, uh, you know, the scout bee that finds the source of sugar, how afterwards, you know, coming back to, to the nest, how it points towards that source of the sugar. And bees have quite an interesting dance, right, through which they, they show uh, where and how far away uh, the source of food is. In the case of the ants, it's quite similar. They, they leave traces, right? So they have these pathways and they leave traces uh, for other ants on how, again, how to find uh, their uh, sources of food. Um, and then uh, if we look at mammals and uh, of course, when we look at dolphins, at whales, uh, maybe even some primates, you know, some apes, they have even more sophisticated ways of communicating with each other. So if in the case of the plants and the insects, we have a lot of chemical communication that is going on, actually in more uh, complex animals uh, like mammals, you know, like dolphins, um, we have animal signaling, right? And that means that they, we have, um, they communicate through uh, sounds, they communi communicate through clicks, through baits. Actually, in the case of dolphins, it was shown that they even name each other. So they have individual names. And um, it has shown that depending on where the pod or the respective group of dolphin is, whether it's in the Atlantic or in the Pacific, they have different languages, right? So the dolphins that are actually, you know, uh, swimming in, in, the, in the Atlantic, they develop their own uh, language and their own culture that is quite different from the dolphins that are swimming in the Pacific. It's kind of like uh, the same way as uh, for us humans, right? As uh, in North America, as we speak English, but if we go to Europe, right, we might find some other uh, different languages that, that humans speak. Um, it's also the case of birds, right? In the case of birds, there is a lot of songs, a lot of uh, signaling that is going on between any two, um, any two uh, birds. Um, you can have uh, songs that are about, again, where can you find food? Or is there a predator nearby, right? And can you hide from, from the predator? So <clears throat> communication has, um, in the animal world has evolved as a very, very um, important way through which animals survive and through which animals adapt and through which they thrive and they, they actually pass on this type of um, knowledge and communication to basically their future generations. Right? Uh, another interesting example is in the case of elephants. So I don't know if you ever see uh, if you ever saw the way that any, uh, elephants communicate with each other, they are what is called seismic communication. So they are basically, you know, um, thumbing down on, on the earth. And they, this is how they are transmitting the uh, waves through the earth, through the ground. And they can actually communicate one with each other through these seismic waves, even from 30 kilometers, that's like 20 miles away from one from, from another. So it's quite interesting how diverse the way of communicating has evolved in the living systems on our planet, right? From um, electrical communication in fish or chemical communication in insects, all the way to, uh, to, um, um, to audio communication in mammals, to um, I, I even uh, to even body language, if we are thinking about the colors of the feathers, you know, that some, some of the birds have evolved. So it's quite complex. And of course, probably the most complex way of communicating right now that we have are the human languages. And the human languages, again, they have evolved as a way for us to uh, not only understand each other and survive and adapt, but also to transmit 
important information to uh, the next generations. And what comes after the humans are basically the computers, right? And based on, based on the evolution of the computers and of artificial intelligence, we now have new forms of languages that are emerging, right? These are the computer languages. And this is why natural language processing and languages are so important for the evolution of artificial intelligence, because what it might be possible that in the near future, um, you know, the, um, when computers will communicate with each other, they will be developing their own languages that us humans will no longer understand. And of course, if we are thinking about communication as a complex system like this, can we model new language emergence? So if we, um, so far we've been trying to understand how complex communication is currently is, you know, from again, cells all the way, all the way to humans. Uh, <clears throat> can we think of the way new languages will, emer will, will emerge? Uh, whether these are computer languages, or maybe, you know, even communicating with um, other, um, uh, with extraterrestrials, you know, in, in case we uh, are, uh, we will be finding, right, extraterrestrials. Or if we are thinking about um, uh, SETI and radio astronomy, if we are receiving all these signals, you know, from, uh, from uh, the universe, um, then how can we spot in the signals that we receive in all the wealth of data that we receive, how can we spot that maybe there is a language there, right? So this goes back to what I was showing you about the stars and the languages. So if we have those signals from the stars, or if we have radio signals that come from the universe, and we have all those data points that look like this, like a time series, you know, like a like light curve, can we understand, can we think, can we <clears throat> uh, find some interesting ways in which we can detect language inside that data? Yeah. All right, so um, any comments so far? Any questions? There, there are some questions there, just okay. a second. So, um, of course, um, there were some discussions whether we can, whether can some civilization um, use a star to produce mm. signals, right? Yes. Going yes. back yes. Uh, to the beginning of, of your presentation, right? That's such a great question. And uh, indeed, it is possible that um, <clears throat> Uh, very advanced civilizations, if, if they exist, they can use uh, stars or the energy of the star uh, as, a, as a way to transmit uh, information uh, at very large uh, distances across the universe. Yeah. So talking about the graphs that you showed us before, the question is, do you graph these numbers to get the general idea of the clusters? Yes. And how does, how is the language of the stars compared to coding? Compared to coding? To, to, to coding. Right? Yes, yeah, it's, um, it's uh, very similar. So any language is just another way of coding information. Um, and in our case with the language of the stars, it's a very structured way in which we code information because we have very uh, strict methods through which we transform those numbers into words. <clears throat> In the case of human languages, human languages are not that strict about the way we code information because human languages have evolved and that there is no, uh, you know, algorithm or uh, we, we don't have a uh, mathematical way through which we develop human languages, but rather it's more interactive between humans, so it's not that um, uh, that strict in that way. But still, even though you know the human languages are not that as strict as computer languages or as coding or as mathematics, they are still they still represent um, a way of coding information that is understandable between the humans that are actually using uh, that language. Yeah. So Question. there are several other questions. Do you need brains to communicate? 
That's a very good question. No, we don't, because we know that cells communicate with each other, and we know that DNA is, is another way of communication. Um, and um, uh, so, no, we can, we can have signaling um, in the form of uh, uh, chemicals being exchanged, and that doesn't necessarily require a brain. And it's the same case for the plants, right? Plants don't necessarily, they don't have a brain and they still communicate with each other. So another question on the same topic, does every species have some sort of communication? Yes, every species has some sort of communication because that's how species evolve and adapt. Uh, so whether we are talking about plants or animals or humans, Every, every species has a way of communication. The fact that we don't necessarily understand that communication, that we don't necessarily understand, you know, what dolphins are talking about with each other, you know, I'm pretty sure it's not about uh, the game, right, last night or something like that. But uh, the fact that we don't understand that, it doesn't mean that they uh, don't um, uh, understand each other and they don't have a very evolved way of communication. It's just different. You know, so being different doesn't mean that it's worse or better. It's just different. And we are trying to understand how different and complex that is. Thank you. Yeah, very nice. So, okay, so what is this communication? So it's if it's so complex and so different across species, how can we uh, model it, right? How can we... If we want to think about, you know, new languages and we want to understand um, a language, an exo language, right, that might come our way, uh, then how, how do we model it? And we know from all these fields, all these fields of science, from computer science, from communication science, from social science, from biology, from astrobiology, so from all these fields that when we are talking about communication, we are always talking about a sender, a receiver, and the message that is being sent, right? Whether these are cells, whether these are animals, whether these are humans. And um, we basically, when we are talking about communication, is a form of exchanging information. And the message itself can be an association of words, it can be an association of chemicals, it can be uh, electrical signal, signals, but any message carries both a meaning, so what do I mean when I actually talk to you, but also a mean of communication. Is it oral communication? Is it electrical, chemical? Um, is it through the internet, right? So what's the meaning and the means? So it always carries these two features, the meaning, what do I mean through that message? What do I want to communicate? And uh, the actual means, how do I transmit it? Is it direct? Is it indirect? How, how do I transmit that? And both the sender and the receiver have to have this kind of vocabulary or catalog, as I was showing you also with the language of the stars when we are creating those dictionaries and catalogs that are similar and that they are understandable. Because if I am trying to um, have a dolphin communicating with a dog, you know, they might have very different vocabularies right in their heads and then they, they wouldn't be able to understand each other while a dolphin with a dolphin, it's much easier to to understand. So can you think of any examples of animals that are talking to each other um, or even computers that are talking to each other and that are using both this idea of the meaning of the message and of the means of the message you know, that is being communicated? There are some great examples in chat right now. People talk about wolves, for example. Yes, <clears throat> and facts of wolves, yes, yeah. And, and another question for you is, what if two generations of AI meet, oh, like say on a faraway planet, let's say you that's send the first question. generation of robots to a planet and after a while a new generation mm -hmm. of AI reaches the same planet, but those robots may have different values because the priorities of civilization changes over time. Yeah. Right? How do you expect them to communicate? That's such a great question. Uh, indeed, um, what uh, most scientists think is that it's actually going to be difficult for, let's say, humans and another species, let's say from a different planet to actually understand each other because 
the context is so different. And these things that I'm talking about here, vocabulary catalog, uh, are very different, right? And then the meaning and the means of the message that is being communicated might be completely lost and you don't understand it. You don't even know it's there. But when we are talking about artificial intelligence and let's say the AI from Earth from the AI with the AI from an exoplanet, then it's more likely for those to understand each other. Why? Because that's essentially based in math and mathematics is a universal language. So um, if it's a possible, so it's not entirely 100% sure that two different AIs, or just like you were saying, two different generations of AIs that would actually understand each other, but it's more likely for two different AIs to understand each other than for two different biological species to understand each other if the context of their evolution has been different, right? So yeah, that's a great question. So what about establishing communication between a um, human-based AI and uh, extraterrestrial-based AI? Is it more easier, going to be easier for two AIs to establish communication than for two biological civilizations. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's basically, yeah, just, just as I said, depending on how similar the evolution of the biological species is, then it's more likely for them to get to understand each other. So for example, in, in the case of humans, we kind of understand uh, ourselves with dogs, right? So probably one of the species that is closest to us when it comes to communication are the dogs because we can train them and they can understand us to, to some degree, right? Um, the, why? Because the evolution between the humans and the dogs has been quite similar and in the in sense of co-evolution, right? So the dogs have adapted to humans and humans have adapted to, to the dogs. Um, but for humans right now, let's say to understand um, uh, a wild species, right? It's, it's much more difficult because the evolutionary paths have been different. So it's the same in the case of having an extraterrestrial um, biological species uh, versus humans. So if the uh, context of the evolution is very different, then it's less likely uh, to be, so it's more difficult to understand each other. But if both civilizations have developed um, AIs based on similar mathematical principles or similar actually informational principles, because it's more than just mathematics, it's also based on information theory and how we develop code and computer languages, then those AIs indeed are more likely to, to understand each other. So let me check. There, uh, there were a couple of other questions. What if the signal is sent to us from another civilization, but intercepted by an unintended receiver? Yeah, that's also possible. And um, it might be possible um, that we, maybe we already have a signal, you know, in the wealth of data that we are receiving from radio astronomy and from all these stars, but we just don't know how to recognize it, right? Because going back to this formula, to this schema here, basically, if we don't have the same vocabulary and catalog, there might be a message there, but we wouldn't understand its meaning, right? It would be impossible for that meaning to be transmitted. Another question is, will we be able to develop something like a Google Translate to translate between us and the extraterrestrials? That would be ideal. That would be wonderful. Um, it's um, that that would require something in common, right? To have to start from somewhere to understanding from hello or from the body language, right? As I was showing here, right? Here, when we have, let's say, two, in this case, right, in, in the case of Tarzan, right, if you know the story, um, e even if we have members of the same species, if, again, their evolutionary paths have been very different and they don't have the same vocabulary, uh, they need to start somewhere. So how do you start? It's through body language. So we don't, when you don't have the actual language developed, you have uh, something else, whether it's ke chemical, uh, communication, whether it's but uh, through body language, even you know some animal species have uh, uh, display a lot of body language. 
uh, that's that's a different way into which you can start to build up uh, from from that uh, language but it's not going to be something like the that particular language is just going to be downloaded in my brain you know like in the matrix movie if you ever watch that movie and uh, then we will uh, immediately understand each other it would be again a process of evolution so that's why communication is an evolutionary process is a complex system um, and uh, uh, that's why it's quite interesting to to study it and so one more yeah. question here yes mm -hmm. uh, wh why uh, I, uh, what if we they don't even communicate in words what if they communicate in colors or smells or exactly uh, electrical signals <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So olf olfactory or smells, that's, that's another way. And yeah, that's right. Here it is an example of colors, how we communicate with colors in, in, our, in our cases through art, right? And um, in this particular case that I'm showing you here, uh, it's just an example of how we can distinguish between the means and the meaning of the information that is being transmitted. So if we have a piece of art, in this case is from this painter Pierre Mondrian, uh, it's a famous um, um, painting called Composition, but we have two of them here. So what's the difference between the two of them? So because one of them was actually painted by the actual painter and the other one was painted by an AI, right? So we have here the same or very similar information that is being transmitted through the same means, through art, through color, through geometric figures. But the meaning is different, right, in, in these two cases, right? It's, it's subtle, but it's different. And us as humans, we can see it and understand it. Does the AI see it or understand it? I don't know, right? Um, and this is just one example. Um, here is another example. If we are talking about uh, communication, what's natural communication, just like you were giving examples of body language, olfactory, chemical, electrical, that's a natural form of communication. When we have developed more complex languages like the human languages or computer languages, that's actually called artifactual communication. Why? Because we are also designing it in a way, right? So uh, we cannot really design the chemicals that, uh, you know, the species that are using chemicals or electrical signals or seismic or olfactory, they don't really design those, right? Those are natural. But in our case, we can actually design these languages. We can design the computer languages that we are using for AI for natural language processing. And again, to give you an example, um, we have the neuron connectivity here on the left inside the mouse brain, but it looks very similar to the, our internet, global internet connectivity. So there are similarities there, even though these are very different. So one of them is natural, is the, um, is the, uh, uh, the brain of the mouse and the connectivity of the neurons. The other one is artifactual, is based on computer languages, right? It's based on human languages and that's the global internet. But again, there are some patterns here that are actually quite, quite um, similar. Um, and in the case of our languages that we have developed, the human languages, actually it's both natural and artifactual. Why? Because um, we our although you know English, Chinese, German, and so on, they evolved naturally with our culture and the way we interact with each other. At the same time, um, we also have some input into how we design, you know, our, our languages and how the grammar rules, right, that we impose. Dolphins don't have grammar rules, right? They have language, but they don't have grammar rules. And some other interesting examples, um, think about this idea that. Uh, in ancient times, actually, we had more than 15,000 human languages because each culture or each group of humans, they have developed their own language. Now we have less than 7,500, right? So we have less than half of that. Why? Because the uh, world has become more global, more interconnected, and we actually understand each other more, and we talk to each other more, and we have the internet. And that's how actually the languages become more um, in. Um, uh, integrated with each other, uh, but, uh, but on another hand, there are some cultures that are disappearing, and with those cultures, then the, those languages are disappearing as well. But we have new artifactual or artificial ways through which we are developing communication, and think about transportation systems, right, where we have uh, <clears throat> in any transportation system, whether it's maritime or air traffic, they are based on um, the same uh, uh, 
the same code or the same way of signaling to each other across the globe, right? So it doesn't matter if that ship or if that um, airplane comes from US or comes from Europe, the way of communicating is the same and it's actually through symbols. It's kind of like the emojis, right, that you use. They, they are, they are, um, uh, their significance is quite universal. It also means that we are moving towards a language that is more symbolic, right? So we are moving into a language that becomes more universal, but also more uh, sparse in a way. Right? Uh, and to give you some more <clears throat> examples, we can have sophisticated way of communicating. So this is a Mandelbrot set, which is from mathematics, right? Versus, you know, a more simple way of communicating, but that is recognized by everyone uh, all over the world, right? The, uh, the Red Cross. The Mandelbrot set is recognizable mostly by mathematicians. But the other one, what we call the trivial or more common way of communicating is more universal because you can find it all over the globe. And um, just to give you another example, for here is an example of, you know, only economists actually will understand what these diagrams mean because it's actually an economic model. So the rest of us should not really understand that. But then we have the other more common way of communicating that we see through brands and symbols, like we see this one on the right, that is more, transmissible and understandable uh, throughout the globe. So what does this all mean? So why are we looking at artificial intelligence? Why are we looking at natural language processing? So in this way, using these uh, interesting algorithms, we can potentially discover these universal markers and signals and systems that they, they might even help us understand, you know, extraterrestrial languages. Um, if we know, if we, are, if we are finding out where these universal patterns actually are, what is the uh, uh, fundamental information theory behind all these, then it's more likely than then we will understand um, uh, um, uh, language that comes from a different planet, right? And we can use AI natural <clears throat> language processing for many things like mapping, as I was showing you with cataloging the stars. We can use it for phylogeny, basically to look at these evolutionary um, developments or evolutionary ways in which uh, the living systems, the complex systems have evolved uh, on, on Earth. We can look at taxonomy or different ways of classifying or systematizing uh, the phenomena that we are looking at. And we are certainly looking at using data science in general. Um, and looking at different data points, uh, whether we are looking at graphs, networks, machine learning, uh, uh, different discoveries, uh, again, to analyze uh, all these data points that come to us in, in ways that we can understand them better, right? In ways that we can maybe even develop a way of uh, universally communicating with each other. So, so yeah. <laughs> That's all I had for you guys. So I'm really looking forward for more questions and, and comments. I know it's been a lot. I know I've shown you a lot and uh, it's been a lot of, you know, uh, research that is, uh, is uh, has been done, you know, at, uh, you know, by, you know, research scientists, but I, I hope you, you enjoyed it and you took some, some very interesting information away from, from this tonight. So yeah, I'm looking forward for more comments and questions. So do you expect that uh, there are some universal laws governing the evolution of communication in the universe? Yes, I think that is, um, I think that is the case. And I think that's for us to discover and it, that would be something very interesting for us to discover. And it's possible that that would be a combination of um, universal laws from information theory with some universal laws from um, uh, from artificial intelligence, from based also on some universal law from laws from complex systems, from complex biological systems. Uh, so, the question is: Is it possible for another civilization that just happens to be? Oh, sorry, the chat just went away. Uh, to have a similar or identical communication method to humans? 
it would be possible if their evolutionary path would be similar to ours. Basically, what does it mean? It means that they would live on a very on a planet that is very similar to ours. That the evolution of the of their species would be very similar to ours. That the evolution of the uh, way they talk, of the mouth, of the tongue, you know, of the anatomical parts that they use for communicating is very similar to ours. And also that the social interactions, because a lot of the language is based on social interactions, um, that those social interactions would be very similar to ours. So it's possible, but I think it's improbable. So. Okay, so any more questions? Uh, there were some questions in the beginning. Let me go to them because I promised people we will get there uh, about the frequencies. Uh, just a second. Oh, the question is, if I aim the radio telescope on a planet, what would be the most common frequencies for me to see the data? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know actually how to answer that. I, um, there are specific frequencies through which, uh, you know, radio astronomy data is being gathered. But um, if we are looking at an actual exoplanet, um, and we want to gather signals from there. Um, I, I, I don't know. I actually don't know what, what would be the, the frequencies if we are talking about um, uh, radio. Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, you're muted, Julia, you're muted. Sorry, I was just saying that we have one more minute left for this okay. meeting. <laughs> and I want to use this minute to thank you. Oh, thank for you. Coming <laughs> and thank sharing you your knowledge with us. This is a cutting edge science. So you've just learned something very, very new. And of course, it was really packed tightly. Right? So right. it, it right. will take you some time to unpack. Uh, I will post the recording online so you will be able to watch it again if you need it okay, and share with your friends. But thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks. Good night. Good morning. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We have people from different places. We had a nice. person from Singapore. Oh, wow, very nice. For that. Yes. Mm. Yes, that's right. Okay, goodbye, everyone. I'm waving too. Yeah. <laughs> it's also <awesome>, guys. <laughs> okay. Thanks again. I mean, oh, Scott. Yes.